Hello, hello. Here in Chapter 43, Assessment and Concepts of Care for Patients with Ear and Hearing Problems. So the most important concepts that we are going to see and to learn in this chapter are the sensory perception, the infection, and pain. Let's talk about the anatomy and physiology review, the external ear, and first we're going to start with the video to understand better, okay? External Ear Anatomy. Today, we are going to learn about anatomy of external ear. The ear is divided into three parts. One, external ear. Two, middle ear. Three, internal ear. The external ear is again divided into three parts, which will make it easier to remember. Its three parts are one, auricle or pinna, two, external acoustic canal, and three, the tympanic membrane. 1. Oracle or pinna. The entire pinna, except its lobule, which is made of fat, and the outer part of external acoustic ear canal, are made up of a framework of a single piece of yellow elastic cartilage, which is then covered with skin. There is no cartilage between the tragus and crus of the helix, and this area, which is without cartilage, is called the incisura terminalis. An incision made in this area will not cut through the cartilage since cartilage are unable to heal properly, and therefore, this area is used for endoral approach in surgery of the ear. Pinna is also the source of graft materials for the surgeon, cartilage from the tragus, perichondrium from the tragus or concha, and fat from the lobule are frequently used for reconstructive surgery of the middle ear. The conchal cartilage has also been used to correct the depressed nasal bridge while the composite grafts of the skin and cartilage from the pinna are sometimes used for repair of defects of nasal ala in nasal surgery. 2. External Acoustic Auditory Canal It extends from the bottom of the concha to the tympanic membrane and measures about 24 mm along its posterior wall. It is not a straight tube. Its outer part is directed upwards, backwards and medially, while its inner part is directed downwards forwards and medially. Therefore, to see the tympanic membrane, the pinna has to be pulled upwards, backwards and laterally, so as to bring the two parts in alignment. The canal is divided into two parts, A, cartilaginous, and B, bony. A, cartilaginous part. It forms outer one-third, eight millimeters of the canal. Cartilage is a continuation of the cartilage which forms the framework of the pinna. B, bony part, it forms inner two-thirds, 16 millimeters. 3. Tympanic membrane or the drumhead. It forms the partition between the external acoustic canal and the middle ear. It is obliquely set and as a result, its posterosuperior part is more lateral than its anteroinferior part. It is 9 to 10 millimeters tall, 8 to 9 millimeters wide and 0.1 millimeter thick. Tympanic membrane can be divided into two parts, pars tensa, pars flaccida. What a great and complete video this was. Excellent, excellent video. Okay, so basically in the video we learned about the external ear, we learned about the middle ear, but you have more information if you want to review here in the book and you have the graphics here. We learned about the inner ear and uh, about the inner ear, uh, they are mentioning here that is on the other side of the oval window and contains the semicircular canals, the cochlea, the vestibule, and the distal end of the eighth cranial nerve. So remember, I gave you in the supplemental um, file for these two chapters, 42 and 43, I repeated, I gave you the graphic of all the cranial nerves that you need to be familiarized, okay? 
um, basically the eighth canal, the eighth cranial nerve is related to the hearing and the equilibrium. The organ of corti is the receptor of hearing located in the membrane of the cochlea. The cochlear hair cells detect vibration from sound and stimulate the eighth cranial nerve. The vestibule is a small oval bony chamber between the semicircular canals and the cochlea. It contains the utrial and the saccal organs that are important for balance. Um, here you have another graphic. It's very important to um, differentiate. This is the pinna, this is the external. All this area contains the middle ear. Here you have the tympanic membrane and here is the inner ear. Okay, um, yes, we can see in my notes uh, here the cochlea is similar to the snail, how the inner ear balance system works. That's something that we need to watch in another video. It's very, this is a very nice one also. When I select the videos, I try them to, to be the to be um, nice videos with great explanations. Okay, here we go. I'm trying to get it. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Apparently, I need to make this work better because there are two videos here in my notes, but we are gonna watch this one first. Oh no. <laughs> Oh no. Okay. Um Okay, this one. Probably I need to separate this a little bit more in order for you guys to see it. And this one as well, because it comes from the HTTP to this one. Okay, I think it's going to work now. Let's go. Deep within each ear, there is a balance system called a labyrinth composed of three semicircular canals. These semicircular canals are also connected to the cochlea, which is the organ that allows for hearing. Each semicircular canal is responsible for sensing a particular head direction. Each semicircular canal is filled with fluid, and when displacement of this fluid occurs within the canal, nerve signals are sent to the brain informing which direction the head just turned. The posterior semicircular canal shown here detects when the head tilts down towards the shoulder. The superior semicircular canal detects when the head nods up and down in a yes motion. The lateral semicircular canal detects when the head shakes side to side in a no motion. When a person is dizzy, one of the main tests performed to determine whether the inner ear is the source of the dizziness is the dix halpeck maneuver shown here. The head is turned 45 degrees and the body laid back such that the head is extended about 20 to 30 degrees. If the right inner ear is causing a person's dizziness, eye twitching called nystagmus will occur, a condition called BPPV. Depending on how the eye twitches, specific body maneuvers can be performed to potentially cure a patient of their dizziness. Thank you so much. Another great video. So what this video was explaining us is how exactly the balance work in uh, based on the ear. And it's um, unbelievable to see how these three semicirculars, right, um, they can be related to the position of the head. 
uh, one semicircular canal can tell you if that nystagmus is caused because there is problems in the fluids or in the crystals within these canals that are probably located in the wrong place. So that's why nystagmus occur. And that condition that he was describing, describing is called V as in boy, PP, V as in Victor, benign positional parosigma vertigo. And the difference between this dizziness and the vertigo um, is basically the hearing loss and the 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 time how long this dizziness lasts but we are going to analyze that in more detail further i just wanted to give you the brief uh, explanation now the dix whole pike maneuver is the one that he explained how to repair depending on the movement and the nystagmus okay there is a video here also you have it in your file the file that i uh, added to this class uh, there's more graphics here, the right tympanic membrane. Um, um, the ear and the hearing changes associated with aging. Uh, ear and hearing changes related to aging and associated nursing adaptations and actions are listed in the patient center care older adult consideration. That's a table that is coming. Age related changes in the ear and hearing box. So we can check that later. Um, sensory perception concept exemplar hearing loss. There we go. We're going to talk about hearing loss. And every time you see here a box here that's good to know means that that concept is coming in the exam, okay? So this basically is going to replace our blueprint and all the information that I usually provided to you um, with page numbers. So here you have like kind of interactive uh, blueprint in this video. You are going to see my notes. You are going to see whatever is highlighted and the possible questions that are coming in the exam. Okay. Only the that's good to know are coming in the exam. That means that there is no other concepts out of this book or out of these presentations that are going to be included in the exam. Everything from the book is coming in the exam. Uh, everything that, that says that's good to know. Okay, the most important concepts. Uh, loss of auditory sensory perception is common and may be conductive, sensorial, sensory neural, or a combination of the two. Conductive hearing loss results from obstruction of sound wave transmission, such a foreign body in the external canal, a retractor or bulging tympanic membrane, or fused bony ossicles, tumors, scar tissue, and overgrowth of soft bony tissue autosclerosis on the ossicles from previous middle ear surgery are also lead to conductive hearing loss. So when you see here the comment in yellow means that anything that is in yellow is related to the box. Okay, so if you see something here green, that is not related to the that's good to know comment, only the yellow. If the box here is green, then the that's good to know is coming from the green highlighted. Sensorial hearing loss occurs when the inner ear or auditory nerve, cranial nerve 8, is damaged. Prolonged exposure to loud noises damages the hair uh, cells of the cochlea. Many drugs are toxic to the inner ear structures and their effects on hearing can be transient or permanent. Okay, so uh, let's continue. You see exactly where the middle ear is located based on this picture that is um, positioned in the face, right? Okay, here is a table that is important. Comparison of features of conductive and sensor neural hearing loss. So you have conductive hearing loss, the causes could be cerumen, 
uh, can be, it could be the foreign body. And let's remember that conductive is related to the physical part. Okay, sensorial is related to the nerves. So cerumen is physical, foreign body is a physical um, infection of the external ear or middle ear, tumor, um, assessment findings. You're gonna find uh, all these uh, assessment um, tools. Sensorineural hearing loss, you have the causes, it could be presbycusis. Presbycusis also spelled presbycuasis from Greek uh, means that hearing or age-related hearing loss is the cumulative effect of aging on hearing. It is a progressive and irreversible bilateral symmetrical age-related sensorial. Notice that it's bilateral and it's symmetrical, okay? Age-related sensorineural hearing loss resulting from degeneration of the cochlea or associated structures of the inner ear. At this point, we know what is the cochlea, which is similar to the snail. We know where the inner ear is and the auditory nerves. The hearing loss is most uh, marked at higher frequencies. So the causes of the sensory neural hearing loss could be presbycusis. We know that is uh, the hearing loss, Meniere disease, diabetes mellitus, and we have two tools to measure and to differentiate um, this is the Rene test and the Weber test. Um, we're going to talk about that later. Now, Meniere diseases um, that is mentioned here in the table is a disease of the inner ear that is characterized by potentially severe and incapacitating episodes of vertigo, tinnitus, hearing loss, and a feeling of fullness in the ear. Uh, typically, only one ear is affected initially. Notice the difference. Meniere is only one ear affected initially, but over time, both ears may become involved. We're gonna we're gonna start talking about this little by little and um, in more depth uh, eventually in a few minutes. Episodes generally last from 20 minutes to a few hours. The time between episodes varies. The hearing loss and ringing in the ears can become constant over time. Meniere's often come hand in hand with hearing problems was BPVB, BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, only affects balance and cause abnormal algeric endystagmus. So you can see you have two conditions there. You have the BPPV, the benign paroxysmal position in vertigo versus the Meniere disease, which is the difference in the nystagmus, but also in the time of the episodes, how long they last, okay? And the hearing loss. Meniere disease is gonna come uh, with hearing loss, pro progressive, no? While BPPV, it could come with some uh, popping sound tinnitus, but not this dramatic hearing loss. Okay, let's continue. Um, what else we have here? Mm -hmm. Disorders that cause conductive hearing loss are often corrected with minimal or no permanent damage. Sensory neural hearing loss is often permanent, okay? Presbycusis is a sensory neural hearing loss that occurs with aging. It is caused by degeneration or cochlear nerve cells losing elasticity of the basilar membrane or a decreased blood supply to the inner ear. Deficiencies of vitamin B12 and folic acid increase the risk for presbycusis. Wow, that's very important. Um, I never thought about this. Deficiencies of B12 and folic acids Folic acid increase the risk of presbycusis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we were talking about two tests, the Rene and the Weber test, and I want you to know how this test is done in order to identify if the condition is conductive or sensory neural. And we are going to see here. So I'm going to stand behind you 
Place a finger in one ear and into the other ear I'm going to whisper some numbers. I'd like you to repeat those numbers to me. Is that okay? Fine. 99 For the next part of the test you will require a 512 or 256 hertz tuning fork. To see which hertz tuning fork you have, look at the base and the number will be located here. This is a 512Hz tuning fork. To activate the tuning fork, you should ping it, like such, or you can tap it on your knee. The mastoid process can be located here. Where did you hear the sound best? Second. Where did you hear the sound better? First. So in that example, it's abnormal because the vibration um, is felt in the mastoid process, which is the bony part. Okay. So he noticed the vibration, but the second part, which is the sound proximal to the ear, he couldn't distinguish. So that means abnormal without the sensorial part in the mastoid process he wouldn't be able to hear the sound in the ear do you understand that's the rene test i'm going to ping the tuning fork place it on the center of your forehead let me know where you hear the sound best in the middle And that was the Weber test, okay? So it's very clear, very explanatory. And that's something you need to know, especially all you guys that want to become nurse practitioners. Um, you have to be familiarized with this type of practice. Age-related changes in the ear and hearing, and I highlighted the most important. You see, I highlighted the ones in green, the cerumen, um, the nursing adaptation and actions to teach the patient and caregiver to irrigate the ear canal weekly or whenever he or she notices a change in hearing. And the one here in yellow is the one that is good to know. So ear or hearing change, the ability to hear high frequency sounds is lost first. Okay, the high frequency sounds is lost first. Older adults may have particular problems hearing the F, the S, the SH, and the PA sounds. Provide a quiet environment when speaking close to the door to the hallway and face to face to patient. When a patient is having problems with hearing loss, you don't scream, you talk to them face to face and that's good to know. Okay, let's continue. So we have some important considerations. Mutations in several different genes are associated with hearing loss. One type of hearing loss among adults has a genetic basic with a mutation in gene GJV2. And this mutation causes poor production of the protein connexin 26, which has a role in the function of cochlear hair cells. Other genetic by variations in some of the genes for drug metabolizing enzymes, cytochrome P450 family, slow the metabolism and excretion of drugs, including autotoxic drugs. This allow autotoxic drugs to remain in the body longer, thus increasing the risk for hearing loss. Now, um, there are a lot of parts that I highlighted, several paragraphs in this. Um, in these exams that we are taking in samples, um, I am 
testing you on the most important parts that I consider and I saw the questions that are coming in the exam. So, but basically this genetic information is good for you to know for your NCLEX. Uh, I've been reviewing different sources, different books, and basically this is what you need to know for the NCLEX examination. Okay. That's why I'm highly, I, I am highlighting this because hearing loss may be gradual and affect only some aspects of hearing. Many adults are unaware that their hearing is impaired. The prevalence of adult hearing loss in the United States is estimated to be approximately 15% of the adult population between 20 and 69 years of age. This amount increases among people in the 70s and 80s. And here there is another comment in green. Uh, teach adults that the danger in using objects such as hairpins, ear candles, cotton swabs, or toothpicks to clean the ear canal. These can scrape the skin off the canal, push cerumen up against the eardrum, and puncture the eardrum. If cerumen buildup is a problem, teach the patient the adhere only to the method of removal recommended by the primary health care provider. And that's good to know. This is excellent information to tell your patients and sometimes it's against whatever everybody else is practicing, right? We all, a uh, certain point, we're using cotton, cotton swabs or any other tool, I don't even want to mention it, to clear the ear canal. To clean the clear the, the ear canal. So we have to avoid this type of practices. Teach about the use of protective ear devices such as over the hair the ear headsets or foam ear insects uh, inserts when exposed to persistent low loud noises. I just remember um, a horrible video that I saw an insect inside the ear canal. Uh, to prevent infections, suggest using ear plaques when engaging in water sports and using an over-the-counter product such as swim ear to help dry the ears after swimming. We're going to talk about the, another condition um, that happens only in those that love to go to swimming pools. Okay, so... Um, Another another comment that's good to know during the interview, sit in adequate light and face the patient to allow him or her to see you speak. The patient's posture and responses can provide information about hearing equity. Again, the face-to-face -face practice is good for the patient to get a sense of what you are telling them and for you to assess the condition of the patient. Best practice for patient safety and quality care, communicating with a patient who is hearing impaired. And there, there is a list, very interesting list. And here, do not shout. Shouting often makes understanding more difficult. That's, I, I told you that before. Have the patient repeat your statement, not just indicate assent. That's uh, what we call verbalized understanding. When you teach the patient something and you request the patient to repeat whatever you explain, right? So that's important. Personal history includes paths or current signs and symptoms of ear pain or discharge, vertigo, spinning sensation, tinnitus, ringing, decreased hearing, and difficulty understanding others when they talk. Um, so here basically they are giving you an explanation. Vertigo is a spinning sensation, tinnitus is the ringing. So um, you should ask about past ear infections or perforations, excessive cerumen, drug use for any condition. Some are autodoxic, having a toxic effect on the ear, uh, inner ear structure, such as NSAIDs, certain antibiotics, aminoglycosides, diuretic, quinine-based medications, and certain cancer medications. We spoke about also that certain chemotherapies affect the vision and also hear the ear. Um, exposure to loud noise or music during work or leisure activities, air travel, especially in um, 
unpressurized aircraft. Yes, that happens to all of us when we travel, right? Um, that's important to assess. The patient with suspected hearing loss assess the ability to hear high frequency consonants. We mentioned that before, the S, the H, the F, the Th, and the CH sounds. Assess visible ear structure, um, frequency of asking people to repeat statements, withdrawal from social interaction of large groups, um, the turning fork test, we saw it, is the RENE test performed by the primary healthcare provider health can help diagnose hearing loss. Otoscopic examination performed by the primary healthcare provider with an otoscope is used to assess the ear canal, eardrum, and middle ear structures that can be seen through the eardrum. Um, nursing safety priority, action alert. Do not use an otoscope to examine the ears of a patient who is unable to hold his or her heart still during examination or who is confused. The otoscope is this uh, tool that the doctor is going to insert in the ear and has some light on it. And if the patient cannot hold his or her head or is confused, the patient can move move abruptly and this practice can damage the structure in the ear. So be careful with that, okay? Mm, um, pay attention to your NCLEX examination challenge questions. If I were you, I would pay attention to these questions. Um, Imaging assessment, skull x-ray determine bony involvement in otitis media and the location of otosclerotic lesion. Otosclerotic, spongy bone lesions of the middle ear. That's otosclerotic, the spongy bone lesions of the middle ear. And diagnostic assessment of hearing imbalance can be useful uh, in isolating the degree of hearing loss and in some cases the cause. Audiometry, you have the audiometry performed by audiologists is the most reliable method of measuring the, the acuity of auditory sensory perception. The intensity uh, also is going to be analyzed. Um, planning and implementation, increasing hearing, nursing care priorities, focus on teaching the patient about the use of any prescribed drug therapy and appropriate assistive devices, helping the patient and family to maintain or increase communication and helping patients find community agent support. Um, Non-surgical management uh, for early detection helps correct the problem causing the hearing loss and drug therapies, assistive devices are useful for patients with permanent hearing loss, amplifier increased telephone volume, allowing the caller to speak in a normal voice, video doorbell systems, a hearing aid is a small electronic amplifier that assists patients with conductive hearing loss, but it's less effective for sensor neural hearing loss. So diagnostic studies and associates nursing care, you have your odometry, auditory mainstream brain stem evoke response, and you have a number of different uh, imaging assessment, what imaging, you could use the CT, uh, laboratory test, tympanometry, all this assessment for that particular condition, decibel density and safe exposure time for common sounds. Notice here the average residence or office in, in decibels is 40, uh, conventional speech is 60. So this conventional speech that I'm having with you now is 60 decibels, right? If we hear a motorcycle is 90, a jet engine is 140. Wow. So um, whispering is 20. Do you remember that video that we just saw the guy whispering numbers to the patient? So he was testing the low pitch, 
right? Versus the high pitch that was te tested with the Weber and the Rinet test. Um, here you have different um, um, tools and equipment behind the ear, behind the ear, um, hearing aids for the patients, um, BTEs behind the ear. Uh -huh. Cochlear implantation. We have to speak about this. Cochlear implantation may help patients with sensory neural hearing loss. Although a superficial surgical procedure is needed to implant the device, the procedure does not enter the inner ear and does not consider a surgical correction for hearing impairment. And we are going to see this video now. Cochlear implant is a specialized hearing device to restore hearing to patients who have severe to profound hearing loss. The procedure begins by performing a mastoidectomy accomplished by removing the hollow bone behind the ear. After making an incision and retracting the ear forward to expose the mastoid bone surface, the honeycomb partitions of the mastoid bone are then drilled away down to where it connects into the middle ear. There are important structures that are preserved during this procedure, including semicircular canals responsible for inner ear balance, the bone that separates the brain from the mastoid cavity, the sigmoid sinus, which is a large blood vessel, corda tympani nerve, which supplies sense of taste to the tongue, the facial nerve, which is responsible for facial movements. Once the round window is exposed, a well along with a channel are drilled into the skull upon which the implant is seated. The electrode array is then inserted into the round window and gently threaded into the cochlea. Wow. The skin incision is then closed. After the incision has healed, the external component of the cochlear implant can be worn to start the process of hearing restoration. That's amazing. Thank you very much. Excellent video. Okay, so that is how they do the cochlear implantation. Nursing safety priority. Action alert. Teach patients the safe way to clean their ears, stressing that nothing is smaller than his or her own fingertip should be inserted into the canal. This, I think this is the third time that the book is suggesting that practice means that is important part of the nursing care and definitely is coming in NCLEX. Um, Tympanos plus tympanoplasty reconstruct the middle ear to improve conductive hearing loss and we are going to watch this video to understand how tympanoplasty is done okay let's go Surgery to repair a large hole in the eardrum, known as a tympanic membrane perforation, can be accomplished through the ear canal. In this underlay technique, the skin of the ear canal along with the perforated eardrum is first lifted off the bone. 
A graft is then placed in such a way that it lays under the eardrum after the skin is placed back down into normal position. Cartilage is often placed to provide support to the graft. Dissolvable gel foam sponges are placed to help keep everything together as it heals. Please note that in reality, the skin flap is elevated off the backside of the ear canal and not from the bottom as shown in this animation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, so we know the cochlear implantation, we learn about the tympanoplast tympanoplasty, and um, it's very good to include this video so we have a better understanding. Patient and family education, preparing for self-management, um, avoid using hairspray, cosmetic oils, or other hair or face products that might come into contact with the receiver. Check with your audiology provider to determine whether you can swim with your particular hearing aid. Oh no. You have to wait for that, right? Some are water resistant and do not tolerate submersion. I would definitely wait, even if it's water resistant. <laughs> Others are waterproof and can be used while swimming. Oh, oh no, no. We don't want to go through another surgery to remove that and have a new one, a new replacement, right? And that's another good to know. Teach the patient to follow other measures to decrease the risk for infections, such as avoiding people with upper respiratory infections, getting adequate rest, eating a balanced diet, and drinking adequate amounts of fluid. Surgery is performed only when the middle ear is free of infection. So when a person is having this type of condition, you have to be away uh, from people with upper respiratory infections. You need to have adequate rest, eating a balanced diet. That means low sugar, low carbs, right? Not really high fats and drinking adequate amount of fluid because fluid removes the bacteria, the virus or whatever the causative agent is through the urine. Okay, keep the patient flat with the head turned to the, turned to the side and the operative ear facing up for at least 12 hours after surgery. So if the surgery was on the right ear, that's the ear that has to go up and the patient is going to lie on the side of the non-operative, meaning the left side, the left side, give prescribed antibiotics to prevent infection. Uh -huh. Okay, good. This is basically whatever we explain in the video. And a stapedectomy is another procedure that they are doing to improve the condition. Let's see the stapedectomy. <laughs> of surgeries are no yoke so the best thing is to prevent okay patient and family education preparing for self-management recovery from ear surgery avoid excessive coughing for two three weeks that's even if it's an abdominal surgery you need to prevent that when blowing your nose blow gently without blocking either nostril and with your mouth open avoid rapidly moving the head bouncing and bending over for three weeks is 
that's common sense. Patient and family education, preparing for, preparing for self-management, prevention of ear infection or trauma. Do not use small objects, such a cut and tip application matches to pick keys or keys or hairpins to clean your external ear canal. And that's good to know, again, they are repeating this over and over. Avoid or wear head and ear protection during activities with high risk for head or ear trauma, such as wrestling, boxing, motorcycle riding, and skateboarding. Uh, some textbooks are talking about helmets, which is the same, avoid or wear head and ear protection okay so it's another way to prevent there is always a risk for failure that might lead to a total deafness on the affected side um, talking about the surgery other possible complications include vertigo infection and facial nerve damage remind the patient that here is initially worse after a stapedectomy post of operative care remind the patient that improvement in hearing may not occur until six weeks after surgery drugs for pain help reduce discomfort and antibiotics are used to prevent infection the surgical procedure is performed in an area where cranial nerves 7 8 and 10 can be damaged by trauma or by swelling after surgery review your cranial nerve page and sheet that I provided because some questions are coming in the exam from that sheet. Assess for facial nerve damage or muscle weakness. Indications include an asymmetric appearance or drooping of features in the affected side of the face. Ask the patient about changes in facial perception of touch and in taste. Vertigo, nausea, and vomiting usually occur after surgery because of the nearness to inner ear structures. Anti-vertiginous drugs such as meclizin, anti-emetic anti drugs such as ondrancetron may be prescribed. This last one is preventing vomiting, right? Prevent falls by assisting as needed and instructing the patient to move slowly from a sitting to a standing position. Prevent injury by assisting the patient with ambulation during the first to two days after stapedectomy. Keep top um, bedside rails up and remind the patient to move the head slowly to avoid vertigo. Here you have an explanation in this graphic about the stapedectomy that we saw in the video. I thought it's better to see in the video, right? To watch the video. Remember that you have a legal and ethical responsibility to make sure that you communicate effectively so that the patient receives the best care possible. Lip reading and sign language can increase communication. Remember that sign language, uh, managing anxiety is important when you communicate effectively with the patients. Teach patient how to instill eardrops and irrigate the ears and obtain a return demonstration. Um, at the beginning of this session, uh, when they were explaining about the parts of the ear, the external, the middle, and the ear, they also explained the proper way to examine the ear. So you have to pull the ear up and to the side. That's the best practice, okay? Um, and that refers to this, teach patient how to instill eardrops and irrigate the ears and obtain a return demonstration. You can go back to the video. Uh, to prevent infection after surgery, instruct patients to follow the information located in the patient and family education uh, box, prevention of ear infection or trauma box. Teach patients who use a hearing aid and their caregivers how to use it effectively. Okay, and we're going to stop here this part and let's continue later with otitis media.